You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 176. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be meeting award-winning author Mark Edward Langley, who writes the Arthur Nakai mystery books set in the American Southwest. His latest novel in that series, When Silence Screams, was published on August 31st. Really enjoyed chatting with Mark about his work, uh, about setting his uh, mystery novels in the American Southwest. So stay tuned for that uh, interview coming up here in just a moment. Uh, first, I want to talk to you about uh, some great deals going on right now because of Black Friday. And if, especially if you're a writer, uh, some fantastic deals. So uh, Pro Writing Aid has their own Black Friday deal and it's going on right now. You can get a lifetime subscription for 50% off the regular price or 25% off the annual subscription. And you can check that out at thrillingreads.com forward slash PWA. Pro Writing Aid is a grammar checker, style editor, and writing mentor in one package. I only promote tools that I use and I use Pro Writing Aid almost every day. Um, I do it to uh, check my emails, social media posts, anything I write, really. And uh, I, you know, of course, I run all my manuscripts through Pro Writing Aid before I send them out to my human editors so I can send them the uh, cleanest manuscript I can. And I've tried all the uh, other different uh, software uh, checking uh, programs out there. And uh, Pro Writing Aid was by far my favorite one. So I highly recommend it. And so it's a great opportunity now to get a great deal. Uh, so you can go to thrillingreads.com forward slash PWA uh, for all the details. Uh, but please note that you will need to act fast because the sale ends on Tuesday, November 30th at 1159 PST. That's Pacific Standard Time in here in the United States. So go to thrillingreads.com PWA for all the details. All right, here is my interview with uh, Mark Edward Langley. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Mark. Uh, great to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, coming on here. And so um, just uh, to get the ball rolling here, can you tell us a little bit about your background before you uh, got into uh, writing? Oh, my. Going back 30 years, I was in the automotive af aftermarket industry uh, from anywhere from behind a parts counter when I was like 20 years old to managing a store and ended up my 30-year career as a division head for a company uh, close to where I used to live. And then all the time doing that, the last 20 years or more of that meant writing the first book, Path of the Dead. Once I retired, I had more time to focus on that at the end of 2016 right there. So 2017, I got things going and submitted uh, several letters of query and some sample chapters. Then I got by 15 rejections and one agent actually called me and became my agent. And then two weeks after that, I had a two book deal. Wow. So like there was like 30 years of the making and then all of a sudden it just like uh, went into a uh, hyperspace. Huh? <laughs> hey, when the dominoes fall, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you so obviously you've always wanted to be a writer. It's always been something you've uh, dreamed about when uh, before. Ever, I worked in a bookstore a long, long time ago, back in the early uh, uh, would have been 80s. And at that time, the television show Spencer for Hire was on with Robert Urich on TV based on Robert Parker's books. And one of the persons I, I worked with, a woman, she says, well, if you like the show, you should love the books. So you should read the books. So I picked up his books and started reading those and collecting all those. And then that got me into reading Mickey Spillane and Ernest Hemingway, you know, and uh, John D. McDonald and so forth. And Tony Hillerman, of course, you know. So they all kind of, I think, without knowing it, by reading them, uh, shaped the way I would write and what I would do. Because I told Ann Hillerman, I said, that, you know, your father taught me about description of landscape. And I said, Robert Parker taught me about dialogue. You know, uh, John D. McDonald taught me about story. And then Mickey Spillane, of course, uh, about action. So I kind of have a melting pot for that to become the person that I am uh, trying to write these novels. And I think I've done a pretty good job. And uh, people seem to agree, I guess. The great, the authors to learn from the, some of the best. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, how did the series come together for you? Like what, what got you interested in, 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 in the settings? I know the setting is a really big part of your books. Uh, how did it all come together for you when you decided to write these books? Oh, gee, back when I was, I'm 61 now. So back when I was 12, 
And my parents took me on a vacation out to Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona. And um, I fell in love with the land out there then. And then when I got to be in my eh, early to mid thirties, I took a two week trip plotting out the first book. And uh, I drove the roads that are in the first book from New Mexico to Montana, and then dictated off into a tape recorder. He came back and transcribed it all down, started then developing characters and backstories and so forth, you know, and uh, putting things together, plotting out my chapters. Uh, I like to plot those out uh, so I know where I'm going. Uh, at some point um, on the first and second book, uh, not so much with the, the fourth one or third one here yet, but uh, I had an idea of where I was going. So I wrote the ending. So I knew I had a place to get to and then just did the story up to that point and picked up and finished the book. But uh, the, the land itself, I love the land itself. I love the people that are out there. Uh, I've been lucky enough to to gain a lot of Navajo friends on uh, social media. And a few of them I met out there uh, doing research uh, for both books. Uh, it was incredible to talk to them and, and learn a lot more than I, than I knew. And so did you base uh, the character of Arthur Nakai on the, on, the, on the people that you interviewed, that you met and talked with? Are they all like all like a, a, com, a conglomerate of people that you've met? No, actually, it's a, it's a funny thing. with I, I tried several different names for the main character and then finally settled on Arthur Nakai because it just naturally rolled off the tongue and it felt natural to, 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 to say that name. Uh, it was actually based on a gentleman I worked with who was a, a Navajo uh, person, and uh, his name was Arthur. And then my favorite Native American flute player, uh, player uh, Carlos Nakai. So I kind of merged that. And then um, I had in mind shaping his features and so forth. So um, I kind of loosely based it on Zan McLaren back when he was younger. It worked out that way and, and started developing characters like his wife, Sharon, uh, was actually based on a television reporter for NBC, uh, locally by where I live, but I conferred back with him on, on messages and so forth and talked to her about what she had to give up to have that job so I could make Sharon more real uh, in the things she gave up to have that anchor job that she's got. So a lot of things worked out really well and it, it turned out good. So I there are people in the books that are conglomerations of people, you know, uh, amalgams of people, but um, like the, the major uh, police captain in there is loosely based on my grandfather, who is a large barrel chested man, you know, but uh, outside of that, it's just the uh, people I made up and you, you kind of like most authors, sometimes they will search online for photographs mm -hmm. and see somebody that to them fits that image and then that's who you you pick to choose uh having to look like so how many books do you have in the series so far uh there are three so far when silent screams is the third book that came out uh, august 31st i am currently writing right now the fourth and fifth books of that and then i've kind of started playing around with uh at the behest of my agent a a new series based in new mexico as well and is that also going to be like a thriller mystery uh series uh, again, mystery, same kind of thing. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a different area. I, I looked to not to be like anyone else. Like I would, didn't want it to be a park ranger, you know, and so mm -hmm. forth, or a lawman, that kind of thing. But um, I looked in New Mexico for someone that I thought would be able to have the powers of the police and do their job as well. And uh, there's a cross certification process that goes on, so it is. Uh, uh, applicable to this characters but um to, i think it's going to turn out really well i did a, a a zoom meeting with department head of the business i'm going to have men i don't want to re reveal too much but the business i'm going to have him in uh we talked for a long time about certain things so i got a background on how they do their work so it uh, it should come along nicely i think i'm not sure when it's going to come out but it should come along nicely Nice. And so it sounds like you really put in a lot of uh, research beforehand, like on the characters and the location. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like you're, you're actually like reaching out to people to talk to them? and Actually, yeah, I went out there uh, for the second book and did research in 10 days in Santa Fe and then went up north to uh, Farmington in that area to Fruit Bloomfield and, and down 550 because it dealt with a lot of fracking and oil. Uh, drilling out, out there on Navajo land. And uh, I talked to some people. I was lucky enough to meet a man, Arnold Clifford, who pretty much is like the encyclopedia of the Four Corners. He knows everything about the geology 
and the flora and fauna, you know, out there. So I talked with him for a day and he took me around to the places I had to go in the book and taught me about, uh, you know, what plants are here, uh, the Navajo history of the place, the geological formation of the place. So I got a lot of information from him that I constantly refer back to. And um, meeting the people that are out there, I love that. They are the ones that I've met with and talked to on Facebook and so forth. They are appreciative that I'm actually trying to discuss things in the books that they deal with on a daily basis and not just create a story that's a fictional story. Uh, it has it has a bit of truth to it uh, in that. And at least, you know, 98% of the locations in my books are real. Uh, only about 2% are ones I made up uh, to push the story along. But um, uh, it's up to the reader to figure out which ones those are. And so can you tell us a little bit about the about the the story and uh, when silence screams uh, what's the uh, what's the book about and what can the readers expect reading it sure it came to be when i i realized and i read about the 5712 missing and murdered indigenous women that went missing uh, on the reservations in the usa and canada in 2016 and i i I thought that's a crazy number. It's a wild number. How could that be so big, you know? And uh, that was just the first year they started actually keeping track of those uh, missing uh, girls and women. So I researched that uh, as much as I could, so much I, I watched every dissertation uh, given in a, a stadium or a, a auditorium. I watched the interviews of families who had uh, had their daughters and so forth uh, taken away um you know some were found some aren't and then um thought well what better way to bring this awareness to people than to have a story about a fictional 19 year old navajo girl that goes missing uh, after falling for a fake profile on social media and meeting the person that has not seen from again that's incredible. I mean, you've been reading about these like all over the, the world about the massive graves of indigenous people. It's just kind of incredible is the stuff that's coming up uh, recently. So this is a pretty uh, kind of like uh, what's been mirroring what's actually been happening out there. It's kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the school thing, the, the bodies they found in Canada. It's all yeah. with the you know, schools back in the day and so forth. And I'm sure be, there'll be maybe something like that found here. You never know. But if it happens there, it happens everywhere like that. But mm-hmm. I wanted to kind of at least raise awareness a bit on this. And at least, you know, I, I put in the forward of the book there that the sales of this book, I'm going to donate a portion of it to Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Organization to further the work that they're doing right now because they take care of a lot of the families uh, with these girls and women. Uh, if, if their body is, is found out of state, they will pay to bring it back and have a ceremonial burial, you know. So it's um, everything they make goes toward the family. So I want to, that's, you know, the one thing I want to do is is make sure that they get a portion of the sales to, to continue their work. Yeah, that's fantastic. And yeah, that's, uh, it's something that just recently has been in the forefront, uh, at least in my radar, because of that, the missing girl that unfortunately turned out dead that, uh, what was her name? Petito? Gabby Petito. Yeah, and, Gabby, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's horrible what happened to her. And you feel terrible for her family, but then I, all these other families are like, well, we are, all our girls have been missing too, and no one cares. And it's just, that's it. I mean, like like a, a character says in my book, when it's a nice white girl on a golf course, everybody hears about it. You know, yeah. But nobody hears about these girls, uh, any girl of color, pretty much, because, you know, it's like, it's like they're considered, you know, throw away or whatever they're not worth mm-hmm. it but every every person every life that's, that's out there is is worth it to, to find out about and and try to to rescue so yeah it, as long as it raises people's awareness of it i don't try to push yeah. any thoughts about it but i give people you know the the information they can determine for themselves and choose for themselves but uh i just i, I felt i needed to do a story uh, about this in a fictional way and so i'm kind of curious now about your writing process um so do you like you, I know you, you put a lot of research into this. Do you outline or do you write by the seat of your pants? No, I do outline. Yeah, I, I do a lot of uh, copious amount of research because uh, so many things are going on that I have to find out about as a writer. I mean, you don't you don't know everything. You know, you have to learn it and, and discover it, you know. But like I just got a, a hundred page document from the University of New Mexico Office of the Medical Investigator. Uh, concerning some cases I'm dealing with out there that I want to kind of work into the book. And what it does for me then is it gives me the procedure they use in their investigation and what they do along with that. Um, I'm waiting for some police files to come in for some certain uh, things that happened out there too, to have the procedure on that and how things are followed in that area. But um, um, I do a lot of research. I have done a lot of 
compiling of things. Uh, I have mostly have three inch binders of <laughs> of research for every book that I do, where I pull things in and bring things around. Um, uh, so it's all something that you have to do, and I I enjoy the research part of it, and then picking and choosing out of that what to use and who's going to talk about that or be in that situation uh, at some point, you know, but I do plot out uh, chapters. I try to do that ahead of time, like I said, so I know where I'm going. And uh, occasionally, I mean, every writer has that where as they're writing and they're maybe into a thought process from the character or a dialogue of the character, the characters kind of come to life sometimes and they will lead me in a direction I hadn't thought of. Oh, yeah, that kind of reminds me. I was the the David Baldacci master class that I was watched a, a few months ago. He has uh, he he showed all the binders that he uses for researching one of his books. And he just like you, he had like I don't know, like five six huge binders just full of stuff. Even though he he might only use like one little paragraph, but he's got exactly. a whole binder on it. <laughs> I mean, I may I may search for anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, hour and a half, two hours, trying to find one certain thing to make even one sentence sound correct. I was kind of curious too, with the um, this crazy year and a half that we've had with this pandemic, I've been asking my guests, um, did, how does that, did that change your writing style at all? Or, I mean, we've all been, as writers, we all have been self-isolating anyway, right? But uh, I'm just kind of curious, how does that change your writing process at all? It didn't really. I mean, I you, you sit down and you write, you know, you have your 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 plan and you do that, you know, but uh, the only thing that really hurt me was I, after when the, before the second book came out last year, I had a, a three state tour lined up at bookstores and then all this stuff hit and everything closed, mm-hmm. you know, so we're trying to figure out what to do. And I jumped on, you know, uh, trying to get as many podcasts and radio interviews as I could get. And same thing for this year, you know, a lot of the major bookstores, unless you're a big name, you know, they're not, um, doing any live signing events uh, they're waiting for the uh, information to come down from on high you know to to have barnes and nobles open up here and there and do things you know um and where i live right now in indiana i mean there are certain areas that are going into different uh say color coded uh deals that are just opening up or have opened up and do this and they're either maybe considering it or not doing it based on what they get down from the the state government. So who knows uh, when actual live events will take place. So you try to do the best you can and, and get the word out into newspaper articles, you know, and uh, podcasts and radio as best you can. A lot of changes, obviously. And I'm kind of curious too, with the, um, are you planning to address the COVID and the pandemic in your future books or are you going to ignore it? I don't think so, because, you know, people have lived through this or living mm. through this. And I don't want to beat it into the ground on things. Yeah. It's people people read novels and to escape things like this, you know, yeah. <laughs> so they don't want to be reading about it while they're living through it, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I don't think I'm going to ever mention it really in there because it just doesn't it doesn't need to be be talked about. Everybody lives it every day. And so when you're writing on a, a project, uh, I'm kind of curious as to do, do you like use like do you write in the same spot? Uh, do you have like goals? Like I'm going to do X amount of words today. I'm kind of uh, curious about your writing process. Well, I do. I write. Uh, I write in my office. Uh, I have a roll top desk. that was my dad's. I write on that with my laptop, you know, uh, do research in there, work in there and so forth. I, I tried writing outside, but there's too many distractions mm-hmm. of writing outside, you know, on the patio and so forth and <laughs> things like that. So the, the less, the less outside noise and disturbance I can get, the more I can be focused on what I'm doing. So um, whether I just write it out by hand, you know, chapter for chapter, what's going to happen in that, in that chapter, uh, then I follow that and then, and go as, as things can be. And like I said, the, the, the personalities of the characters come out, so they lead me in different directions, but it still comes around to where it has to go. But uh, I think when you can create a character that comes across to the reader as a person, uh, they see them as people and not characters. So they, a lot of my readers, they they love the husband and wife uh, in the book. They're like, oh, my wife loves the police captain in the book. A lot of people like my my main character's dog uh, in the book, you know. So um, everybody is finding things they like and they are cheering uh, for the, the people in the book. And uh, that's what I kind of hope to have is that when you read like the third book here, When Silence Screams, my wife, when she reads, reads all my stuff before I get it, I send it in, but she laughed, she cried, she cheered people on, you know, so that's what you kind of hope to have people getting involved with the characters 
as people and wanting them to succeed. And uh, I noticed that when um, when I was doing some uh, preparing some research for this uh, interview was um, on your website. I noticed that uh, your audiobooks are uh, narrated by uh, uh, Bronson uh, uh, Pinch- Pinch- uh, Pincho, who played Valky on Perfect Strangers sitcom. I, <laughs> I, I love that sitcom when I was a kid. I didn't even realize he was doing audiobooks, and I listened to the samples. It does a fantastic job. How how do you uh, get connected with him? Well, actually, the publisher I had uh, sent me snippets of four people reading uh, from the first book my wife and i listened to them where they maybe seem to be just reading it and not really having any inflections uh in there uh, of the text he was actually being an actor that he is mm-hmm. creating that character so if the person would drink something and swallow you'd hear him swallow you know um whatever it may be he he got into each character and formed each character as he read it. And it just uh, turned out so well. In fact, for the third book here, When Silent Screams, he actually contacted me and has offered to help promote the book uh, by doing either a three-way interview or interview with me back and forth, uh, either on live Facebook or whatever. So we're trying to get that worked out with my publicist uh, to get that done. So it's great when the person that actually narrates your book wants to be there to help you promote the book yeah absolutely because usually yeah they're once they're done with the job they just kind of move on to next so that's uh that says a lot that he wants to uh, help you promote it and everything yeah it was great that it was total, totally unsolicited i was surprised to get the email i go wait a minute what's he emailing me for <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so that's that's pretty amazing yeah he and he's He's done a lot of audiobooks. I didn't realize that's what he's been uh, been doing, but he is a fantastic job. He's a great actor. So it's like you said, that's yeah, why he, he still does his acting on television and, and, yeah. and films, I guess, you know, but uh, he's been doing this for a long time and he's won awards at it. So he's he's very good at it. And I'm so I'm I'm extremely pleased with the third book and how he uh, how he narrated that. It's fantastic. Mm hmm. And so you said you're uh, working on the on the fourth book now. Is that what the you once is that coming out next year or was that? Yeah, it should be next year, next August. Yeah, I mean I'm working on uh, doing book four and five, um, so it's it's coming along really well. Uh, it's it's good to have alternate choices. So if you get you know stuck on something else, you can go to something different and pick that mm-hmm. up and, and go from there again and kind of just rotate around uh, when you're working on something. But uh, at first, I didn't think that was possible. But the more I started doing it, if I'm on the fourth book and I get stuck somewhere, I just put that away, call up the next one and start picking up from there and get my, my research pile out for that and go through things and start doing that one. So it's, uh, it's nice to have alternative choices. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good system. That's actually something I'd like to ask my guests um, is because uh, there's aspiring writers that are listening to this uh, podcast. Uh, any advice for an aspiring uh, thriller mystery writers out there? Oh, boy. Um, I always tell anybody, you know, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't become what you want to become. You know, self-doubt is a is a terrible thing to have. And uh, other people who don't have the same dream you have um, don't understand what it's like to have that dream. So always uh, reach for that, uh, that brass ring, you know. Uh, as far as writing, I mean, do as much research as you can about things. Um, sit down, figure things out, plot them out. Um, it's always good to have a direction of where to go and know where you're going. Um, you know, just it's let your mind go to don't actually try to fit what you write into a certain way. Um, just let it flow, do it, get it out there, you know, go back and edit when you have to edit it, you know, but don't try to pigeonhole into things to, to satisfy some people because in that way you won't be satisfying anybody, you know, um, like Rick Nelson said, you can't, you know, please everyone, you got to please yourself. So um, I just, uh, I write for myself. I write for the kind of books and stories that I want to read. So I love getting it out there and having people uh, do that. They just don't try to fit in, just be your own writer, you know, um, and let that just shine through. Yeah, that's that's a great advice. So, um, where can the, the listeners find you um, on your website? It's probably the best place to connect with you. 
Oh, they can do that. MarkEdwardLangley.com. Uh, the books are all on there and uh, certain things are on there. But uh, on that, they can then find my social media accounts and pages on there and click on those and go to that. They can, you know, uh, watch the book trailers, hear other podcasts and radio interviews, uh, read reviews and uh, blurbs by other authors about my work on there. So uh, you can find the books on Amazon, my website, um, soon to be uh, by the end of this month here out in stores, you know, so it'd be a great thing. All right, Mark. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, being on the uh, podcast. Really enjoyed talking with you. Appreciate it, Alan. Thank you very much. I really love talking to you. Thank you for listening to Meet the Thriller Author. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with one of your favorite writers of mysteries and thrillers. Or if this episode's guest is new to you, I hope you give their books a chance. Helping listeners discover new authors and books is one of the coolest outcomes of doing this podcast. As always, you can head over to thrillerauthors.com to sign up to my Thrilling Reads email list. That way you won't miss out on any great deals in thriller and mystery books. You can also check out all the links and resources in the show notes for this episode over at thrillerauthors.com. And also please do subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done so already and leave a rating and review wherever it is that you're listening to this uh, show. If you have done that already, I thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate your support. For my other links to my author website, social media haunts, and more uh, check out thrillingreads.com forward slash links all my links will be uh, on that uh, page so that's it for this episode uh, see you next time and stay safe out there <laughs>